வணக்கம் ஆஃப்டர் த சர்ஜன் டஸ் அ டெண்டன் டிரான்ஸ்ஃபர் ஆர் அ நர்வ் டிரான்ஸ்ஃபர் இட் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் டு ஃபாலோ அப் வித் தெரப்பி திஸ் ரீஹாபிலிட்டேஷன் இஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் பிகாஸ் இஃப் திஸ் இஸ் நாட் டன் த டிரான்ஸ்ஃபர் டெண்டன் ஆர் த டிரான்ஸ்ஃபர்ட் நர்வ் வில் நாட் கிவ் தி ஆப்டிமல் ரிசல்ட்ஸ் ஆஸ் எக்ஸ்பெக்டட் so what do we do when is this therapy to be given what is to be given and how is it to be given this video deals with all these components explained in a very simple way after a beautifully executed tendon transfer surgery you would feel like this but if you do not concentrate on the post operative rehabilitation this is what will happen because if you don't do anything post operatively adhesions joint stiffness reduced blood supply and osteopenia of the bones may result if you do too much it may result in rupture edema pain and again subsequent loss of movements so what is it that we should do the post operative rehabilitation and training after nerve transfers and tendon transfers surgeons should be aware of what is to be done and when is it to be done because all of us are not blessed with experienced therapists to help us basically rehabilitation after nerve or tendon transfers consists of four main modalities physiotherapy splints electrical stimulation and mechanical methods consisting of scar massage ultrasound massage and so on and i shall not be dealing with this in this session so these main parameters are important whether it is nerve transfers or tendon transfers first let us consider rehabilitation after nerve transfers the three modalities which are involved we have already seen physiotherapy electrical stimulation and splints the role of physiotherapy after nerve transfers occurs in two situations first is the pre innervation phase where the nerve coaptation has been done but the nerve has still not grown into the muscle and the post innervation period where the nerve has grown into the muscle the pre innervation period consists of two phases the first is the protective phase which lasts for 3 weeks that is immediately after the nerve coaptation surgery and this phase is mainly to protect nerve coaptation and control edema the second phase is the corrective phase or sometimes known as the silent phase this is done after 3 weeks that is after removal of the pop and it stops when the mrc grading reaches 1 the main stay of the management in this phase is to maintain the passive range of movement to stimulate function of the remaining muscles and to stimulate cortical awareness of donor recipient correlation that is mi mi refers to imagined representation of movement without its physical execution that is motor imagery the patient imagines or images the movement that is occurring by the muscle that is not yet innervated this period that is the pre innervative period will stop when the growing nerve reaches the muscle but how will we know that the nerve has reached the muscle the most reliable is polyphasic motor unit potentials which are seen on emg studies of the muscle that is waiting to get reinnervated the other clinical parameter is palpable muscle contractions that is mrc grade 1 but this is very subjective so now that the innervation of the muscle has occurred the post reinnervation period begins the first phase in this is the reeducation phase which is carried on from the time the mrc grading is 1 till it reaches mrc grading 2 the main idea is to establish donor recipient nerve coactivation by donor activation mirror therapy can be used and also we can start on active range of movements and also maintenance of gravity eliminated positions donor activation means in which the patient activates the original target muscle of the donor nerve to produce motion in the recipient muscle for instance in the case of flexor digitorum superficialis fascicle of the median nerve which is used as a donor to reinnervate brachialis elbow flexion may be initiated by concomitant finger flexion 
There are also what are known as induction exercises that are begun here. That is the donor muscles, that is the muscles that were supplied by the donor nerve previously are activated so that the nerve can be activated to stimulate the new muscle. For instance, if the intercostal nerves have been transferred to the musculocutaneous nerve to achieve elbow flexion, the expiratory muscles are activated by making the patient walk up and down the stairs. So this leads to increased respiratory effort and that fires the nerve to increase the elbow flexion. Now that the muscle power has reached MRC2, the strengthening phase will begin and is followed up till the MRC grading reaches 3. The patient is asked to perform active range of movement against gravity to increase the functional use of new motion and it also decreases the reliance on the donor nerve. This is known as donor deactivation. Donor deactivation means this. In the example of a double fascicular transfer in which fascicles of the median nerve are transferred to the brachialis and ulnar nerve to the biceps to restore elbow flexion, donor deactivation is critical so that patients can flex the elbow while keeping the digits extended, such as when washing their face, as well as fix the digits while keeping the elbow extended, such as when placing an object on a shelf. So this donor deactivation is an integral part of this strengthening phase. The final phase after re of the muscle is the endurance phase or the functional phase. Here, the aim is to increase the MRC grading more than 3. So the patient is encouraged to perform active ROM exercises against light or moderate resistance and also exercises which can facilitate return to pre-injury function or work. Electrical stimulation plays an important role after nerve transfers. That is because electrical stimulation causes contraction of the muscle similar to voluntary muscle contraction. It increases the metabolism and brings more blood supply to the muscle. It helps to minimize the extent of muscle atrophy and more importantly it promotes nerve regeneration. There are basically two types of electrical stimulation, galvanic and faradic. We shall see where they are used. In the pre innervative phase, the muscle is already denervated. So galvanic stimulation is used. It is interrupted direct current with a frequency of 30 Hz with a long pulse duration of more than 1 millisecond. The denervated muscle responds because of the long pulse duration. An easy way to remember this is G-O-D, God. Galvanic stimulation for denervated muscle. Once the muscle has started getting re innervated, faradic stimulation is started. This is also interrupted direct current, but it has a frequency of 50 to 100 hertz with a very short pulse duration of 0.1 to 1 millisecond. It causes contraction and relaxation in innervated muscles. The role of usage of splints after nerve transfers is quite limited. In the pre innervative phase, Static splints are used to protect the coapted nerves and growing nerves. In the post innervative phase, dynamic splints can be used to strengthen the newly innervated muscles. Rehabilitation after tendon transfers also utilizes the modalities of physiotherapy, splints and electrical stimulation. There are five phases in the physiotherapy protocol. The preoperative phase, the protection phase, mobilization phase, intermediate phase and the resistive phase. The preoperative phase is followed when the patient presents and all criteria are fulfilled like complete wound healing. The objectives in this phase are to provide passive mobilization of joints to make them supple, scar massage and anti-edema measures and strengthening of the muscle that is to be transferred. Once the tendon transfer is done, the protective phase begins and lasts for 3 to 5 weeks. This protective static splinting helps in healing of the repaired tendons and also in edema control. Once 3 to 5 weeks are over after the tendon transfer procedure, the mobilization phase begins. The transferred tendons are mobilized by reinforcing the preoperative teaching and the patient education. We also continue the mobilization of the uninvolved joints and edema control. We begin the home rehabilitation program and also nighttime protective static splinting.
Once we see the movements of the transfer tendons occurring, the intermediate phase begins about 5 to 8 weeks after the surgery with the objectives to gradually increase hand activity, passive range of motion exercises and limited functional movements can be permitted at this phase. Now movements are all present but we now come to the final phase, the resistive phase which begins at around 8 to 12 weeks after the surgery when tendon junctions are strong enough to resist the forces. The aim here is to increase the endurance and strength of the transferred muscles and work related simulated tasks are also begun. The role of splints after tendon transfers could be in the form of static splints or dynamic splints. We shall see the commonly used splints in ulnar nerve palsy, median nerve palsy and radial nerve palsy and where they are used in tendon transfers. In ulnar nerve palsy, the static clock correction splint can be used for protection after removal of the POP following tendon transfer and this splint is used for two weeks but it is used as a night splint for a total of four weeks. The dynamic clock correction splint is used two weeks after the removal of the POP that is when the static clock correction splint is discarded. This will help to strengthen the tendon transfer. In median nerve palsy again the static short opponent splint is used for protection after removal of the POP following tendon transfer and it is used for two weeks. It is continued as a night splint for a total of four weeks. The dynamic short opponent splint again is used for a further two weeks after removal of the POP to strengthen the transferred tendons. Similarly, in radial nerve palsy, the static cock up splint is used for protection after removal of the POP following tendon transfer. This is the dynamic cock up splint. It helps to strengthen the transferred muscles and is used and its use is started two weeks after removal of the POP following tendon transfer. This is the dorsal pull outrigger splint. It is not used much after tendon transfer surgery. It is used preoperatively to strengthen the muscles that are going to be transferred. The role of electrical stimulation in tendon transfers is limited. We mainly use the faradic stimulation because the muscles are already innervated. We start about one week after removal of the POP to get the transferred muscle moving. Summarizing, we will find that in the post-operative rehabilitation and training of either nerve transfers or tendon transfers, the three main modalities of management are physiotherapy, electrical stimulation and the use of splints. For tendon transfers, it is more of physiotherapy and splints usage, while for nerve transfers, it is more the use of electrical stimulation. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about the techniques of nerve repair and reconstruction. And do not forget to subscribe to keep connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.